time of recording, Visual Novel Database has just over 46,500 Visual Novel titles in its database, with over 9,100 of them made using the game engine RenPy. That's slightly under 20% of all Visual Novels, and this percentage goes up every year. But what mysterious figure made this huge contribution to visual novels? Uh, oh, okay, it's this guy. Uh, yeah, I'm Tom Rothamel. I'm the lead developer of the RenPy Visual Novel Engine. So let's have a chat with them. Do you want to tell us what the world was like before RenPy? Visual novels were still fairly new. There were several fan-created visual novels, or at least Western-created visual novels, because they did tend to have original stories. There were some translated Japanese games, both fan translations and commercial translations. And there was, like, the very start of, like, what essentially was, like, the Lemma Soft Forums and the English Visual Novel community. Lemma was probably the guy who, while there might have been other teams that came out with their stuff first, since he created the forum, Tales of Lemma 1 was basically like the first, one of the first English language ones that I saw that was, you know, the classic visual novel style. But his game, Tales of Lemma 1, was one of the first, and it sort of formed a community around it. That community slowly grew, but, you know, making games back then was arguably fairly hard because you needed... Essentially, you'd had to develop your own engine as part of the game. Mm. And that's kind of where I, I came in. You know, I'm not an artist. I'm an, not a great writer. I mean, if you look at Moonlight Walks, the first version, you can see I did all of that and none of that was great. You know, the one thing I could do is I, is I was a programmer. I was going to grad school at the time for computer science with a specialty in programming languages. So I said, okay, I can, you know, procrastinate on my intermediate pre-dissertation steps. I'll go bang out a visual novel engine. And, like, the first version of RenPy probably took, like, a week or two. Like, many of my early projects, it didn't seem to go anywhere in that first week. So, okay, I'll get bored. I'll go back to studying whatever. Summer 2004, I was interning in Washington, D.C., which is why you see the Washington, D.C. photos in the RenPy tutorial. Oh. You know, I was on my own, you know, had a reasonable amount of time. And that's when I made version 4 of RenPy. You know, it became version 5, 6, 7, and now 8. Yeah or just all that same code base, hmm. like repeatedly expanded, made better. I, I had enjoyed the genre, wanted to communicate back. And when I saw people were actually using those early versions, which frankly weren't very good, you know, I said, okay, let me actually use what I learned to make an actually decent version that has, you know, everything working. People started using it and, you know, ha having people use your stuff and seeing what people create with it. It's very synergistic with the community where, you know, people make games that motivates me to put work into the engine. When did you decide to go open source with development on it? I originally estimated that like the visual novel market would be like maybe 50 to 100 games total. I say, okay, maybe half of those would be run by. Well, how much can you make 50 people times, you know, maybe 50 bucks is not really enough where you can make like a commercial project out of it. And, you know, it's still basically, you know, while I do get support through the Patreon and so on, it's still basically a side project for me at best. So the thought of it being commercial and like having to support it really didn't come up. I came out of Linux community. I still develop RenPy primarily on Linux with the other systems used as, you know, mostly for testing. So just like the thought that of making it a commercial project, you know, just didn't really even occur to me. It's really amazing, like the level, the skill level of people coming into it too. There are like college professors who are just trying to teach someone, teach people the basics of game programming, not like actual programmers in training, but just like, Let's give you guys like the rudimentary like game design skills. I want to say it was a school. I want to say Worcester Polytechnic, although I'm not totally 100% sure of that. But like they were using in their like game design for game designers as opposed to, you know, game programming courses. RenPy is just an example to get people making something interactive, something with multiple paths. RenPy is designed for, for essentially like three kinds of uh, people. The, the, the rank newbies who, you know, don't even like it'll install your text editor for you. It's still a pretty good one, but like... You know, it assumes that, like, you don't even know how to install a text editor on your computer because nobody's born knowing how to install a text editor on your computer. Yeah. And then, like, there's a kind of intermediate stuff, which is, like, you can customize the existing GUI. You can swap out images for the background. You make, you know, a reasonably polished visual novel, you know, with image swaps and, you know, maybe a little bit of, like, screen editing, you know, character customizations, things like that. And then, like, if you do want to learn Python and you want to learn how RunPy works internally, you know, there's that function there. And a lot of RenPy is actually built on top of that functionality. Like the launcher is a RenPy game, which I'm not sure how many people realize that. I feel like I wrote that in one of my videos. Yeah, I think I think you did, yeah. <laughs> I have to reference yeah. my videos a lot. One thing I'm, I'm proud of is RenPy's easiest game. Like that first game that people make is, I, I want to say, very simple. And it's very simple to like click through, you know, get your environment set up. And then it, on the other end, you know, push a button and we make zip files, push another button, you upload to itch. You know, people who don't necessarily want to get too involved in in like the mechanics of distributing a game 
can still get something functional. The default run by interface is there because, you know, the alternative is no interface. Like people always, you know, some of it's like, okay, it's not a polished game, but like if it's your first game, you want to be getting the story in. You want to be learning about, you know, the characters, you know, the basic writing in the game itself. And so having something there means like, you know, even if it's not a polished interface, it does have the features of, of games where people spend a lot of time polishing them. So I thought by doing that, we could make visual novel development accessible to a lot more people. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that about the UI because it's actually not bad, that default UI. It's pretty darn good. I did have a designer in, and uh, I believe it was Orosine I did, did the design of that. It isn't like the earlier programmer art default UIs. But at the same time, a lot of Rempai's design is, okay, you get like something decent. Literally, one of my feedback was more generic. Because <laughs> uh, it had to work just as well as like a high school, you know, fluffy romance. And, you know, somebody just got murdered. And I think it does a good job at that. Let's talk about that moment when you realized like Renpai could compete with like other game engines. And I, I don't mean just like other visual novel engines. I mean, I think when it comes to releases on Steam, like Renpai's up there with like, uh, not quite up to like Unity's level, but you're definitely competing with Unreal Engine at this point. Yeah, it, it's somewhat weird because like Rumpy kind of predates like many of those game engines, or at least like the kind of current market where like game engines are used for every game or, or a large number of games. So like there never was like a, a thinking of that, like, well, why can't I compete? Um, at the same time, like it was a few years ago, I saw Steam DB and we weren't, Rumpy was number five uh, on the list of game engines. I'm like, Oh, it was like, I think it was like 2%, something like that, of, of Steam games are, were made with RenPy, and like, that's a lot. And I'm guessing if you go to Itch, it's also a pretty big number. I kind of, for a while there, I knew every game that was made with RenPy. You know, then I kind of started, you know, losing track of every game. And then, you know, now people, you know, VNDB is a great resource for all, that does let you now filter by engine. You know, Itch and Steam both have at least ways to figure out which games are made with which engine. And so... You know, I'm glad people use it. It's, it kind of shocked me how many people were using it. What's an interesting part of RenPy that you just wish more people knew about? I want to say the accessibility stuff, which, which is kind of hidden. You hit Shift plus A to get at it. But, uh, you know, it, it's probably the only feature where I just get people spontaneously coming up to me and thanking me for it. That's things like assistive, um, you know, assistive text. Um, the ability to like increase the size of the fonts. Um, the ability to go into high contrast mode and things like that. And, you know, it's like not everybody needs that, but the people who use it, you know, you know, are, are some of the few like players that will actually come up to me and, and, and say, you know, and they appreciate it. So um, it's always like when I can come up with a new assist, assistive thing, it's always just a really nice one feeling to do it. And, and it seems to benefit, you know, make the game accessible to, to a, lot of the, a lot of the community. Um, as developers, I think, you know, take a look at like the alt tags on user interface elements. There's also an alt character that if if you that the alt character says stuff, then it's only said if there's assistive if uh, the speech assistance is turned on. So you can actually make, despite a visual novel, you can make it quite uh, accessible to people who you know whose vision isn't perfect. I don't know if that is that's a good no. Answer, that's a but. really good answer. Are there any RenPy features that you'd like really like to implement into RenPy, but just you can or it's like unfeasible? I'd say probably the biggest one would be just like trying to develop console support in an open source project would just be a huge undertaking. Yeah. And coupled with like the console lifespans being, you know, short relative to Rumpy's lifespan, trying to do that in-house in, in Rumpy, I think is just like having to deal with Sony and having to deal with Nintendo and having to deal with Microsoft and get everything through, you know, their licensing process just seems like maybe a bit of a jump too far for, for an open source project, especially because, you know, the, there's like a lot of licensing things where you have to satisfy the studios. Plus like, I, you know, everything I do is open source. Everybody can see everything I do. When it comes to the console stuff, it would have to be hidden away. And and um, so I'm guessing that would just be a challenge to implement. I mean, is that a thing you would actually want to do though? Even if you had the capabilities of it, that just sounds like a that's a full-time job right there. Probably is for like a few months each time a console comes out. Like most of the Rumpy stuff, like, you know, it starts off with me doing a lot of it. And then people learn how to do it and support each other through through the process. And so like it used to be I was doing most of the tech support myself. And now we have, you know, the community has built up and it's largely the community answering each other's questions with me either dealing with, you know, either somebody gets something wrong or, or just something just 
you know, nobody's done it before or, or stuff like that. But it's really, you know, we have this the, the great community that like has people making all kinds of games and helping each other out. I've had games that I wrote like five years ago where I can still export it. Like it still works fine. I, you know, a couple things need to get changed, a couple little perks, but for the most part, like most of it's kind of set in there. Do you ever kind of imagine there being like a great reset where just the language is going to have to change a whole bunch or? The answer is probably not. I understand like games take people years and years to make. Like I mean, how long did Kitao Shoujo take to make? At, the, at least five I years? I said eight. Yeah, eight years. Rampai was changing fairly fast, but at least it basically ran throughout, throughout the entire course of that. And, you know, I, so I've tried very hard to keep like backwards compatibility and not breaking people's games. While I can't necessarily do that everywhere, it's at least something I strive very hard for. Even the Python 2 to Python 3 transition, most games I've tried have run without changes to them. Um, do some stuff in the background. To, it actually will fix your game up if it sees some of the more common mistakes or just common Python 2-isms don't work in Python 3. It'll actually go in behind the scenes and fix your game to make it keep running. Thank you. And I also lived, you know, through the Python 2 to Python 3 transition, both in RunPy and also in my professional career. And, and that was a really rough one. So, and I think it showed, like, you know, in general, whatever the improvements are, breaking your existing stuff is probably not worth them. Now, what I do a lot is to replace the old way with a new way and kind of remove the old way from a doc from the documentation without deprecating it. For example, like I could see replacing the menu statement with the choice statement, let's say. Um, I don't know if I'll pull the trigger on that one, but like it's possible. Now, the old menu statement would still work if you had an old game that you need to run, but it would get removed from the documentation. And now, you know, what we currently call in-game menus, we now call in-game choices. A recent one was like, there was a function runpy.file, which opens a data file if you ever need to do that. Got renamed to runpy open file because that's more in line with the way I've been naming stuff lately. But the old one still works. Which let's talk about drag and drop for a second because I was talking with uh, Agilis specifically where he's just like, why, why would you put drag and drop in a visual novel engine? There were several games at the time that had like, you know, essentially like card game mechanics and things like that. So drag and drop is... is you know, there's a lot of, like, simple game mechanics. Like, you know, even, like, research management or, like... You know, like, Rumble is designed to support, like, visual novel-style RPG. There's actually three games, which is, like, RPGs, but, like, guided ones, but, like, where you can do, like, party formation and stats and stuff like that. It's designed to do life simulation games, completely story-based visual novel games. And for, like, the simulation games and the RPGs, I think, like, being able to reorder stuff via drag-and-drop is intuitive than doing a ton of menuing do that sort of thing so that's where the thought from that came from which that's i think one of the number one requests right now is just more rpg engine stuff so this is where like the real interview starts uh how do how do i tell them not to do that <laughs> the problem with an rpg engine is whenever somebody asks me it's like so what would you like your rpg engine to do what i find is like actually making the rpg engine is if not easy once you understand what you want from rpg engine run probably, you can do it in but every RPG engine is different. And short of like, you know, referencing, I want to be exactly like Final Fantasy, you know, 30 million. People have to understand what they want from their RPG engine, how they want the stats to work. And that's really hard. Building a fun RPG, making it balanced, that's a huge amount, amount of work. But once you've done that work to make your RPG engine, I think programming it is, if not simple, a lot more doable. And that's with visual novel is we all understand how visual novels work. What's your favorite Renpai game? Uh, I really like Palinoris just because, like, you know, it has a bunch of things that, that it shares with Moonlight Walks. It hit me at a time in my life when I just really needed needed that game. Um, so it was, just, it was just a game, you know, that's by uh, by Studio Watercrest, I believe. And it just, you know, I've just really, it just really hit me and it just has stuck with me since then. I look at games, like, somewhat differently than the average person does. When I was playing um, Doki Doki Literature Club, uh, it pops up a Rumpai exception, like, halfway through the game. I spent like half an hour trying to figure out why it was that particular exception. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the most unique interaction. Everyone else, it's, oh, it broke. Only you would have to go, oh no, this is, I need to log this. Yeah, well, my, my, my first reaction is it broke. And then you realize, okay, it didn't actually break. Because that message doesn't make any sense for how it could have broken at that point. <laughs> Rumpai sometimes uses exceptions to do things internally. 
mm. that it just catches and you never see. And just one of them happened to be lying around like in the middle of Python. And when they went to display the error handling, it said, well, I just pick up the last one that happened. It must be the one you want me to handle. Pops it up onto the screen. <laughs> it has nothing to do with what you were doing. <laughs>